Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you to Talking Galleries and Lucia for this uh, opportunity of being here today addressing you all. Okay, so artificial intelligence, that thing that no one is talking about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, but uh, I think precisely for that reason it's important to address that matter. But there is so much noise about it. There is a lot of noise, a lot of excessive conversation that is an excess of opinion, that is an excess of even of alarm about it. So I think since today we have the opportunity, we have three professionals in different fields, but you all three know a lot about AI and you have experience in AI. So let's take that opportunity of half a calm, informed, situated <laughs> conversation about that. Of course, we can address what are I would say the challenges, but I would not say that we need to address what are the dangers, unless you, unless you disagree. Just a quick note to point out that I would invite you to think of that not as saying, okay, what about the AI, this outburst of AI in the case of the arts? I don't think that's the... I would say, let's say what the arts have to say about AI. I think, in my opinion, all companies developing AI algorithms should have artists in the staff. Artists are people that uh, not only uh, research the potentialities and research the limits of a new technology, but they do more than that. They try to think what does it mean that we have this technology today? How is the world in which that technology appeared? And uh, what does it mean that we use that technology? I mean, can we think of a more relevant question if you are a company developing AI? So that would be my first. Big companies, please, hire artists. Open AI, you need artists mm -hmm. in your... Of course, I mean, that's... so. Of course, we are here to address what's going on in the art sector, what's going on in the art creation, what's going on in the art uh, market because of AI. But I think we can uh, try also to just think about AI from the perspective of art. That would be like my, my invitation. Um, I suggest that our guest, that I will just ask three questions and I will ask them Three or four, that depends on how quick you are in replying. <laughs> and uh, after that, we can really discuss what we have on the table. So let me introduce our first guest. That will be Mario, because you chose to <laughs> <laughs> sit there. <laughs> Mario Klingemann. Mario is an artist, as you very well know. It's an artist that uses algorithms and artificial intelligence to create and investigate systems. He's particularly interested in human perception of art and creativity, researching methods in which machines can augment or emulate these processes. Thus, his artistic research spans a wide range of areas like neuro neurography, generative art, cybernetic aesthetics, information theory, cultural data and storytelling. He was the winner of the Lumen Prize Gold in uh, 2018, received an honorary mention at the Briggs Arts Electronica 2020. His work has been shown in international museums and at art festivals like Arts Electronica, the Centre Pompidou, ZKM, the Barbican, that's a show, the show in Barbican will be uh, uh, very soon in CCCV. Um, the Hermitage, the Photographer's Gallery, and, uh, and so on, ending by the MoMA in New York. Thank you for accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, to have you here. Um, my first question is very broad. In your experience, what is the most attractive aspect of creating art with AI? And more than that, do you consider this technology a paradigm shift or it is just another tool. <laughs> Good thing, yeah. Well, thank you very much for having me. And, uh, well, it has been a great two days already. So, well, I think what attracted me most 
to AI was its ability to to make the Im immeasurable measurable. So to turn things that we thought could not be measured into something like numbers that make things comparable. Because I like to try to understand how the world works and especially complex systems. And uh, there was always this field which is very subjective and it's pretty much like until AI came, well, it was mostly opinions or descriptions, but you could not mathematically operate with it or so. I mean, it's beautiful, but I have maybe a very German mind of uh, looking at these things and I like to put numbers to things. So um, talking about the subjective, so it's I started by kind of like I come from the tradition of cybernetic aesthetics, which was kind of also what the what drove the early pioneers of computer art, which is kind of like the theory, like, can you measure art? and what makes it interesting, what, uh, yeah. And then of course, once you can measure something, you can try to drive something else, a process by it, trying to optimize it or emphasize, uh, de-emphasize certain aspects of it. And so I was very fascinated by Abraham Moles and Herbert W. Frank, uh, uh, Helma, uh, Helma Frank, uh, all these early pioneers who tried with their means back then to, to solve this, but it felt like they only could reach to a certain point because it needed this deep neural networks actually to to turn very complex data into something uh, that then can can be used kind of uh, in algorithmically and make things comparable because i think that's that when you can measure something you can look put it in a space and this is then the the latent space which we hear a lot about which is kind of these virtual spaces where everything has a place and you can like put compare artworks uh, artist styles uh, texts music everything you can put them in relationship to each other and uh, and try to find some new truth about it or problems or hopefully well use that space to navigate and that's kind of how i feel about working with ai for me it's kind of a journey through these universes that you create or other people's universes but that are well outside of this world they are part of this world but at the same time they promise to be new worlds because this world i don't know if if i wouldn't have become an artist and had lived like 200 years ago i would probably have be tried to become an explorer and find those last uh, remaining white spots on the map and try to f see find something that nobody has seen before but yeah that's long gone uh, but now we have these new new spaces of possibility that uh, make it also much safer too <laughs> so i don't get bitten by snakes uh, so and <laughs> there's always the promise that you might discover something uh, that uh, is different and of course be being numerically and uh, yeah, like that you can control it. You can try to first identify common themes and cliches and things, but at the same time, it's in my and every artist's hand to control that or try to control that journey to unknown, unknown spaces and hope you pick the right route. And yeah, for me, this is really kind of this abstract journey. And then of course, lastly, yeah, that suddenly everything that was separate in some sense before, let's say literature and movies and photography and painting, shares this common space or can share a common space which it already does in our brains so we have no problems in ha having all these things uh, parallel and uh, and of course they in inform each other and influence each other and now these models allow you to do similar things with their own limitations of course but uh, uh, I, it seems to be a space that is open for a lot of exploration and discovering things. So, and that's kind of what keeps my curiosity peaked there. And uh, what was the last question? Like, uh, the, if it's a new paradigm, yes. Yeah. So, yes, I, I believe uh, there are elements to it which are like 
It is a tool, but it's a tool with abilities that have not been available to us before. And uh, it, the problem is, of course, in the end, it's the output often operates still in the same space as uh, anything else. And uh, so a lot of the things that AI produces is absolutely mediocre and uh, kind of derivative. But at the same time, I believe it opens like used in the right way. It, like any other tool, it can be used for creating things that is, well, might be very relevant to our times and work with the current problems we have or the current issues. And so everybody getting overloaded with information. So it's almost like we have to ha use it now because otherwise we'd get, just get drowned. So yeah, <laughs> maybe that's... That's a very, you are very positive about it. You can tell that in oh, work. <laughs> I'm, I'm mixed. Or, uh, I have mixed feelings, but generally I always uh, start with a very positive outlook and look f uh, hope for the best. But of course, uh, there's always the danger anything, any tool can be used f uh, for bad purposes and the more powerful it is. So, but at the same time, the same tool can also help to, and it's, it's still up to us to kind of educate ourselves and learn. And, and every new tool has the danger, of course, that uh, it first overwhel overwhelms us and we still don't know. Like, there's always the shock and awe until we all learn more to, to read it, to understand the outputs and not be just impressed. And I mean, there's always the, that's the, the benefit of the pioneer. You can impress very easily because nobody has an idea. But over time, I have big hopes in humanity and in, human, in the human mind to adapt to any kind of challenge. And maybe, and the good challenge is always something where you grow on. So yeah, I still have hopes that we, we we might master this. <laughs> Beautiful. It's nice to start with like a positive yes. uh, view. So you already said a lot of things oh, that God. we could discuss, but let's let's skip that for later and open the mic to everyone on the table. So now Fernando, this way we do like art, science, art. Okay. If you allow me, <laughs> uh, I'm very I'm very excited to have uh, sorry to have Fernando here. Uh, for one reason, because it's very important to have the scientist on the table. It's very important to have the voice of the scientist. And also, not only scientists, but Fernando, it's, uh, if you allow me, you're like a usual suspect of uh, <laughs> art and science collaboration, which a, a lot of people in the art uh, uh, sector are grateful. When we find artists, uh, scientists, that are willing, that are open, that listen, that are uh, available to the crazy approach of art. So, the proper introduction, Fernando Cucchietti uh, is the leader of the Data Visualization and Analytics Group at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Holds a PhD in quantum computing, this mysterious that we have now, the quantum computing, so perhaps we can go a bit into that. PhD in quantum computing and his work focuses on scientific data visualization. That's why the link with art can be so strong scientific data visualization, and data science applied to industrial problems, machine learning and artificial intelligence, and so on. He also works with the team on science dissemination, again, another important link with art, science dissemination, creating video documentaries and interactive data visualization that explain the science done at BCT, at BST, at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Fernando is also the chief data officer at Mitiga Solutions, working to extract value and insights from uh, data on natural disasters on others. So, Fernando, thank you for being here. Um, same question to you. I will repeat it so you don't need to remember it. In your experience as a scientist, what is the most attractive aspect of creating artworks with AI? And do you consider it a paradigm shift or is it just another tool? Thank you for having me first. And uh, thank you for having me in company with uh, esteemed artist. I have known their work a, a little bit. Um, uh, and yes, thank you for, for having the scientists here at the table. Everybody says that you have to have the artist at the table, and here I am sort of <laughs> <laughs> intruding on the artist table. Of course. Um, <clears throat> so from my point of view, uh, we, we come from the uh, utilitarian uh, aspect of uh, AI and machine learning models. We work with industry, we work with uh, academia, trying to solve uh, technical problems for have coming up with a, a name, and 
we because we do data visualization, we employ a lot of um, techniques that come from art. We also collaborate with artists and we also try sometimes uh, our own stake at, at, try, at producing art pieces, mostly because uh, it opens up um, new questions, new ways of solving problems, new points of view that we haven't uh, considered before. And uh, also it allows us some freedom to explore new tools and, and to uh, try to discover new things that uh, in our day-to-day -day, uh, project-based uh, tasks we, we don't have time to do. So this is uh, part of uh, a little bit of the, let's say, uh, practical way of why we do it. There's a lot of uh, fulfilling and, and there's a lot of uh, fun in, in doing uh, this, but uh, it, it has uh, definitely a practical side. So from, from our point of view, artificial intelligence is uh, a tool for artists. And as, as we create our documentaries, our, our visuals, our, our things, we are employing artificial intelligence as a one more tool, right? And, uh, but it, it, it has a little bit of... Um, of, of magical uh, context uh, or for some, for some reason, we do see it as really, really just a technical tool. And uh, coming from, from, from the developing of these type of algorithms, there's not a lot of magic uh, inside. It, it's really perplexing how good the results are. That's the, the only thing that's still... That's magical somehow, no? It is magical yeah. in, in that sense, yeah. But there's no actual magic, no? It's like... A, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like, like with, with magicians, you know, when you, it's magical, it looks great, but when you see the trick, uh, it, it's not magic uh, behind the curtain. Uh, so for us, it, it is a powerful new tool, and I agree totally with Mario, we're, we're just at the discovery uh, of this new tool. We're, we're just starting to play out with new things, and new, every, everything is amazing because uh, everything is new. Nobody has uh, done that before. And eventually, I think we will progress a lot. Uh, and it is, in that sense, um, also a paradigm shift. Because it is a, a new tool. It's just a new tool. But it's just as powerful, I don't know, as, as the uh, recording of uh, audio in, in the you know, yeah. 19th century, or mm -hmm. electronic music uh, mu uh, instruments, or digital uh, visuals instruments in, in the 90s. All of those were new tools, but so powerful that they created a really huge paradigm shift in, in art. They cre allowed for many, many things that were impossible to create or, or just uh, too difficult to be <coughs> just the common denominator, the place where you can start from. And so if you can start from these things that were really so difficult before, it is a paradigm shift because now you can dream uh, so much more. So you would say, sorry to interrupt, but that's important. So you would say that the appearance of AI now, you would compare that that's so strong as the appearance of sound recording in the end of 19th century, of the appearance of electronic uh, instruments, you would, I mean, that means a lot. That means that it is really something now. Yeah, for, for in, that, in that sense, it is a paradigm shift because mm -hmm. I think it's a really, really s uh, strong te uh, technology, as strong as, as those uh, that I mentioned. I think it is uh, going to open so many new ways <coughs> of doing things. Now we have uh, <coughs> telephones and everybody can film. Not everybody is, uh, 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 you know, is able to do yeah. a Hollywood quality type of movie, but everybody can do stuff from all types of level. That, wa that wasn't even possible 20 years ago, uh, the level that we can do it now. And <coughs> Has it changed the uh, art and, and industry? Yes, it, it has impacted a lot, uh, these things. But the, um, the profound change is that now these digital tools allow the, the people at the frontier of the exploration, the artists, they are doing stuff with these digital tools, with phones, with uh, uh, digital editing of, of e video, for instance, that is uh, really breaking everything that we have thought about movies and, 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 and cinema for decades. And this is going to happen with artificial intelligence. I think Mario is, is right. So we, we are now creating amazing stuff. And I, I really look forward to see what we can do in, in five, ten years from now when we get more established in, in the possibilities that are being opened. Very interesting. So that's, that's, an, that's an interesting time to research and create. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We have to make a two-hour conversation. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Maria, I open now the mic to you, so everyone is in the conversation. And uh, So Maria Arnal, thank you for accepting thank you. our invitation. 
I'm sorry, I keep just putting my hand in the mic, sorry. Um, Maria Arnal is one of the most recognized and groundbreaking voices of the contemporary music scene in Spain. She's a great musician. I, I, I assume that you already know that. She has published two length albums for which she has obtained many awards. She has performed in some of the most important venues of electronic and pop music, such as Sona Festival, and other luring venues, that's the TED Talks, this year in Vancouver. She's also a composer, not just a singer. So as a composer, she has participated in AIR for the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2021, co-creating a sound piece with John Talabot, you know, very good electronic music, musician, with whom she also co-created Sirena for the Hyper Mirador Torre Glorias 2022. Go check it. That's a brilliant piece. It's Brilliant sound it's installation. It's not as loud as we would love to. Okay. <laughs> so when you arrive, <laughs> please say, please. There's a problem with sound installations. Okay. Yes. But that's nice. You arrived there. So, okay, we are music lovers. Turn yes. the thing up. Please. Yes. That would be nice. So that's a generative uh, piece that you can see in the Mirador Torre Glorias here in Barcelona. She co-directs together with the curator and researcher Jose Luis de Vicente, that is all, also part of this program. She was speaking yesterday. So, together with Jose Luis, uh, she has directed the sound essay Cada Capa de la Atmosfera, here, done here in CCCV next door, on climate change and sound awareness that has been nominated to two on this awards. And she's currently composing her next long-length album and collaborating with the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. You are in everywhere. So collaborating with the Barcelona Supercomputing Center to create a new piece. We are all excited about that. That will be released in October 2023 in the show about AI. Where, in the CCB, three of where us. you all are. Yes. So that's why how important you are. So Maria, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for accepting the challenge. Because thank you, you could have said, hey, I am I am not that much in the art, I'm a musician, yes. but I know that you like to accept the challenge. And you have now, as your CV reveals, I mean, quite an experience in installation art, at least. So Yeah. Please. Thank you. Thank How you. cool is to work with AI? I'm to is be it here and to sure. listen also to you and and Please. all your points of view. And thank you. Uh, Luis for inviting me. So basically to the first uh, question, uh, my first contact with this tool uh, was through, uh, well, I was really like excited when I listened to Holly Herdons, who is uh, actually like the pioneer uh, in, in voice modeling. Um, with uh, her, la her last album, Proto, that I think was released like four or five years ago. When she released that uh, album, who was, um, who was an, an experiment on training uh, a voice model uh, called Spawn, uh, I decided that I, I wanted to work with her. So I asked her to produce one of uh, the songs of my second album, which was the only one that was not original. This was like an, an old traditional song from Catalonia that used to be uh, like sang uh, all over the Mediterranean. It's called Al Candela Civila, and this is the translation is the song of the civil. The civil is a woman which has like the power of an, uh, vision uh, to to the the power of seeing, watching the future. Um, this is a pagan uh, character that was real. You know, there were women that had this uh, this power due to you know taking some magic leaves uh, in Greece, <laughs> in Delphos, and they, in their trance, they could like say something. And this was a practice that was really, really consolidated, like lots of kings, uh, warriors, you know, would go there to Delphos, which if you haven't been there, it's really amazing, beautiful place. And they would ask her uh, uh, like questions about their future. Uh, strategic, imp important ones. Um, then this character was somehow like spread into the Mediterranean. There were civilas also in the south of Italy. Uh, they appear in uh, in big uh, literature uh, classics, no? and with their power. And then uh, Catholicism just took this character, which is really weird because she was uh, like 
a pagan character. She was a woman and her power was not associated to any like uh, male uh, uh, main character. And she was considered to be like a prophetess, a biblical prophetess. She had this power and what she could see in the Catholic mythology was the apocalypse. But apocalypse in Greek, this is a common uh, modern Greek word, it means um, uh, revelation. So it's a new shift, a new way, in, uh, a watching shift, a new way, a new way of watching the, the reality. No? And I love how this resonates with our world. So I wanted to do, this is a solo. Okay, so now this song is still sung the night of, the, of Christmas, the 24th of December, in some uh, places in, in Spain, in Valencia, in Mallorca especially, and it's considered um, uh, UNESCO immaterial heritage of the humanity. No? So it's a big thing. So I wanted to do like uh, an update of this song uh, for this new world. We are somehow like for so many reasons. I did this album di uh, during the pandemics. And so I wanted to like, and all the album was somehow, you know, uh, about this topic, the end of an era and the beginning of another one. And it's called Glamour, which means like lots of voices. No? Uh, and this was so present. So I wanted to do this solo song into, I wanted to, to transform it into a choir song in which this uh, civil is singing with the world that is changing and any sentient, any anything in the, this hyper uh, natural world, you know, every voice would be like part of this choir. And I thought that, of course, we could have like different voices, you know, human voices uh, and, you know, animal voices and sounds and to build like this kind of sound shape, a uh, sound um, uh, scene, sound uh, um, a landscape, you know, soundscape. Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, but finally, it was so obvious that we needed, you know, a synthetic voice. And this is how I reached uh, uh, Holly, and we were working together on this production, and it was great. You know, I, I loved working with her. She's amazing. Some months later, so we released the album. But some months later, she was invited by uh, Sonar to do a residence here in which she chose three singers, local singers, in which I was one of those, uh, because she wanted to present for the first time her new tool, uh, the voice model Holly Plus, which was, has been uh, awarded. And, and um, this was my first uh, like um, experience using a tool like this one, because it was not anymore like uh, I don't know the the the, the voices she used to uh, to produce my song were not her voice, you know. And we could use uh, like this was really astonishing. I could sing with a mic, and this mic would be connected to her uh, voice model, and that would sound like her, you know. And in real time, we were like dedicating three days to just like put ideas on how to stretch and use this tool, you know. And it was really like blow minding for me because this is my craft, you know. All my artistic practice is based on the craft of my voice. I'm passionate about human voice and its mysteries. And I just like have dedicated so much time to think, okay, here I'm putting a vibrato. I'm, I'm like breath breathing like that, you know, I'm taking lots of classes. And so for me, it was really like a paradigm shift, like a personal one, because suddenly I could have a voice without a body. And... I was like, okay, I I really want to do something. This at one point, I would I would love to to do a voice model out of my voice, you know. I sorry, and so some months later, uh, I was invited to do a TED talk uh, in in the TED uh, talks this this year in Vancouver, and that was crazy because uh, the the main topic of every like of the main part of the of the conference was about AI, and so I could listen to um to really like um, amazing people that are on the top of this of this transformation, and I was really like both excited and disappointed at some of sometimes there were people that were like super alar alarmed, you know, like but really like very uh, people that know very well these tools some some of the people like for, for example um the creator of of chat 4 was like using its uh moment you know 
to speak to just to demonstrate how he could do like a shop list. You know? <laughs> and it was like <laughs> okay. While there were other like ph philosophers, you know, um uh law lawyers that were speaking really about its dangers as how, how they they thought that that we are we would die, you know, very soon because of AI. Yes, I, I don't remember the name now, but I can I can listen. Like, okay, we're going all to die, and he dedicated like nine minutes to just say we're going to die, we're going to die, like this, like that, like that, you know, we need. But so I was, uh, that was an amazing experience for me to also get in touch with uh, not only the part that has to do with music, which is basically with, with what I connect the most, you know, um, but to see also how like very like uh, people that know very well these tools and are working from different points of view, from arts, from research, from philosophy, whatever, you know, uh, are dealing with all these challenges and confusions and excitements. No? Um, and so finally, I, I got invited uh, uh, because uh, to this um, Barbican exhibition that is going to be presented in CCB, 19, 17th of October this year. And so um, uh, along with the scientists, Maria, Maria Cristina Marinescu, Kim More, and Maite Melero. Melero. Yes, and Ivan Path, you know. So we have created an amazing team, and we are um, we are going to present a project that has to do with a starting point that is like F, uh, actually like creating this voice um, model uh, out of my voice, but that will be trained during six months. This six months into becoming like a choir voice model, and we will record every person that will visit the the installation. And I'm planning to do a lot of like actions out of it. For me, what is really interesting, and now I will respond to the second, we will answer to the second question, okay? You don't have to. Um, <laughs> it's okay, no? Um, so, what it's really crazy for me is that it, it has to do, like, it's. So as an art, as a singer, you base your identity on how your voice, uh, how you sing, you know, you can shape it and it takes years to do it. No, um, I find it's really uh, like a paradig paradigm shift that you can now sing with the voice of another person, but also that you can create voices that doesn't exist, like a voice of thousands of people, which we, what, which is what we are planning to do, but not only because uh, this going, this experience is going to be playful because you will sing and then I will be your choir and my voice will be harmonized. So we will have like four Marias, eight Marias singing, uh, which is something that I haven't learned <laughs> yet with my body. And this is just the beginning of this tool. I'm planning like to do so many things with it. No? Um, what makes it also like a paradigm shift in, in the music industry is that, I don't know if you know it, but some months ago uh, there was this viral song uh, made with a, uh, it was a duet between the Drake and The Weeknd. And of course, they didn't know about that, you know, but this, this song, their voices had been trained through their own songs. There is no legal uh, approach to this, and this is if it's happening, it means that it will not stop happening, you know. So for me, what is really like uh, what 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 it um, what it it's it 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 makes it a paradigm shift. It's not only uh, that it's opening new possibilities, but also like the velocity and the scale of it, you know, because. Our world is not connected now as is now connected not as it was when you know the electronic music began or when the, the electric guitar was invented. Now it's really like fast; it's seconds, and and this makes it really like uh, direct in a, a scale, a scale global scale that have not, not been proved before. You know, so this would be an idea. Then the other idea, which in music is really important, but in general, you know, how these models are trained, are trained on data, and from which like the owners or the creators of this data hasn't uh, doesn't have the consent, doesn't given the the consent. This is a very important thing for me. What it's really important and interesting is to create a social awareness about how these tools can involve like uh, the, the lack of welfare for artists and for like citizens. And um, 
Yeah, and and I I don't know. I have many ideas, but I think it's the yeah, moment to just to like. You're making that up. very difficult. Like a lot of things happen already. But let's okay. Let's let's uh, um, let's talk about the last part. Um, there is a legal issue, but not. It's not only legal. It's a philosophical. It's totally creative. philosophical. Yes. So these things are being trained. Are being trained on massive data sets, and. Uh, it is very clear now that the access to those data sets was at least blurry. I mean, the conditions to the access. Of the, for instance, in the case of OpenAI, that it's very famous now because of uh, ChatGPT. So it seems that what they did, and that sounds brutal, it's like they downloaded the internet. They read the internet. How brutal is that? And uh, when you do that, you probably... Um, read a lot of things that were supposed to be read, but I don't know if they were supposed to be worked on systematically as AI does. So I don't know if you think, I mean, I have the impression that that AI is taking, for instance, the aesthetics of collage, the aesthetics of sampling, the aesthetics of derivative work. I have the impression that it's taking that aesthetics that is very well known to all of us to an, a new dimension. And we have to say that the art market is still a bit reluctant to those kind of dynamics, although they are quite old. I mean, the art market still functions as attached to the idea of the singularity, of the originality of the work, of the or the, the limited series of copies, this kind of thing. So, what is your experience uh, in relation to that uh, problem, because it is it is important. I mean, it is important that uh, the work can be properly paid, that galleries can properly uh, sell the works and exhibit it, and that collectors know how to relate to those uh, problems. That uh, records can be. I mean, it is an important problem. The economy that allows us to work. What would be your take on that? I just would say into the, the like, um, so basically I think maybe Drake was super happy about that, you know, but mm -hmm. the record level yeah, and everything, yeah. not so there, Probably, yeah. you know, yeah, just, I was just, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you want me to, okay. I want you all to, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> well, of course it's a tricky topic, I mean, in a nutshell, I, I'm kind of one of those people who say what's, okay for humans is also okay for machines in that sense that uh, we can all go to the library. Of course, it, it happens at a different scale. But I think maybe what this whole new paradigm of AI shows is that copyright is, oh, well, which is one of the parts where it boils down to, is just not really up for this new way of discovery because that's kind of okay so i i come from the theory that nobody of us is really creating anything we are all when we are we think we are creating we are just discovering something in the possibility space of things that are possible and uh, some people just happen to be earlier and so in a sense copyright is almost like a colonization of uh, possibility space. So somebody comes there and decides now this is mine, I discovered it and now they try to build a kind of a fence around it but uh, of course and they try, I don't know, try to build the, a maximum kind of uh, claim around what they, what they claim is their creation but of course now comes AI and uh, kind of makes it difficult because like where, where does your claim end and the next one start because as we realize everything influences everything and uh, like if if everybody like who comes first can just claim like a gigantic parameter around their work then n nothing can be created anymore so and what happens with your voice then well that's the this is a part. different this is the the answer it's not yeah, Not but then what happens it. if somebody who has a very similar voice to yours also wants to become a singer? So there is now the problem now, of course, so far nobody could measure this, right? I don't so have an answer, eh? I, no, no, I, I like, know. But I just, this is what's happening, really. Yeah. Like, okay, so your answer, I, I understand I can be like, 
I, uh, I agree with some of the things you say, you know, but when they come to, into this, into like your actual like voice. Yes, but it again, like your voice, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure your voice is very unique, but like <laughs> how far does your voice kind of reach out that nobody, because uh, the danger comes that in order to enforce all these new rules, it will need again AI yeah, or some subjective judgment. And then some new singer comes in 20 years and just happens to, or whatever, your daughter <laughs> who yeah. might have your same and then some ai says sorry you can't upload this because yeah, it sounds too similar and you have to pay royalties so i think it's very dangerous to try to kind of define laws around uh, this wake field of creativity so in the end i guess well my th ideally everybody's behaving in a in a nice way and tries to respect say okay sorry uh, you are just in this space so i i have to wait for like or i have to do something else again like there's this these dimensions in copyright where like it seems to be after a certain time it's okay again so and there are all these different radii which say okay this is allowed and this is not but in order to make it law you have to kind of make a sharp boundary which is not realistic with actually how creation works so i don't know, i i don't have a solution either yeah, yeah, yeah. I just find it interesting that kind of these times where these where everybody's uncertain. I love this because yep. yes. the moment regulations and things come in, it's kind of getting kind of boring again or safe. So now it's like what we heard before. It's a bit like Wild West. And then, of course, some people will get shot. <laughs> I, I would say that for me, it's more about like raising awareness, you know, and like having these kind of conversations, like make them bigger than the people we are here, you know, like really like putting them into into like into more like mainstream, you know, um, uh, levels uh, so that not so many like few people get a lot of power out of it, you know, which are like yeah. the fastest or the ones that have more power of it, you know, and then can this can lead to extreme misinformation and we know all the list of the things we can imagine that go wrong, you know. But in terms of voice, like if someone uses my I have to think how like it's acknowledging also um the tool, you know, it's getting to know it deeper because if someone takes it and then says whatever I'm not like so I don't know, you know, something that it's like not what I think and uses my voice to say it, you know, uh, for example, or um, like this, this is the like the more the most obvious thing, you know. So I, I for me as a person that is going to use this tool and that is creating it like along with the BCC, you know, and you is we need to think how we are like somehow uh, regulate its use, you know, and it doesn't have to do through copyright. I, uh, it doesn't have to be through copyright, you know. Okay. We can be also creative in thinking like in, in new ways of regulating that can allow creativity and, you know, experimentation. Let me just quickly, yeah, so, yeah, please. I mean, so you are really very concerned about like kind of your voice as a style and something, but I think in the end, it isn't it about how you use your voice and like where and when you use it. Yeah. So it's kind of you as a person who who are the artist, and then uh, so I, I wouldn't be. And you already years, managed everybody to. Everybody will will have a, a voice model yeah. out of it of yes, the voice. You know, this is going to be super. Uh, they can never be you. That's the thing, and it will always be clear and very no, quickly that. Uh, no, it I can think, it can re really be super confusing. Mm, I think sure. you already I, like at least you are in a s already safe because you have managed to get to a certain position where, well, you like if somebody steals your voice, let's say the social media uh, neighborhood watch will very quickly kind of point them out and because you are still there and say that wasn't me and that means just like the uh, that well what was it yeah that other rap thing uh, very quickly got so that somebody had like fame for i don't know 100 uh, 100 million likes or so but then it's over and then you're still there and they can only do that trick once so i wouldn't be too worried i mean i'm worried more about kind of new artists who try to get into this who get into a space that is more and more confined uh, by rules and regulations and you actually can't find because yeah, that's, that's the thing. So there will be all these broken AIs that will detect in order to enforce the law what, like, 
like if you are allowed to be creative and uh, also there should uh, and because there's this gray area right it's like what do you care if some kid kind of takes your voice and makes a little thing of course you care if some uh like big artist does the same but then so but the machine doesn't uh, distinguish between that so it just stops here and says well the only voice that the person that is allowed to use that voice is you so i don't know I, I find it difficult so i just feel maybe one should more trust into kind of one's already status as a as an established artist that you can share some things and uh, people will eventually not want to copy they want to develop their own voice. Yeah, yeah, but then but they need, for example, my consent, you know? Well, okay. <laughs> It's not about, like, money or something. I want to know it, you know, when it's used it, and, and when it's used and in which conditions, you know? Yeah, you, everybody would like, to, I don't know, yeah, I, I totally understand. I think sometimes, uh, yeah, you're I understand right. you, uh, <laughs> also. Let's open to Fernando. Si. No, sorry, and, and the legal questions are... are, are really far outside my domain of expertise and I don't know how they will fix that. But raising awareness is exa exactly what we need because right now, for instance, we are also worried about how we share our private data and how it's used for advertising or whatever. And this was done in the 2000s when we were ha happy using these social uh, media yeah. networks <coughs> and giving out data without knowing how it's going to be used. And now what's happening is that everybody is scared to put out things online because it will be stolen for training new models and what it's going to change the internet and how we, how we use it and how people put out things because until we fix it or until we find some ways uh, to, to f pay out artists or, or the sources of data, nobody will put out things, code, uh, music and text because it will be, get stolen. And if you put it out, right now you know it will be, be, be used and stolen. So there's no way to protect it. So it's changing the way artists and programmers and, and lawyers work and, and use the internet and how they share stuff. And it will have some profound implications because, for instance, right now some people are doubting if the newer models will be actually better because they won't get good data, good new data. Right? Really? <laughs> yeah, wow. except un unless, oh, you train it, <laughs> unless you train it with your own data, like you're yes, training with your exactly. voice. I That's heard what? that it's not true, but <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, like you cannot train, uh, train it with the output of the previous models because it... Mm, well, maybe the previous models are already good enough that they can extrapolate and... Uh, but I know, <laughs> I, I read that too. So, I mean, I think it's the hope of people that actually, yeah, that this will not happen. But <laughs> maybe we have already reached a certain point where it's good enough for most. So, but yeah, I mean... I agree. I, I have certain data that I would never put online, like uh, on on cloud storage, because I I know I, I whatever Google or Amazon will use it for training, whether I want if I agree to that or not. So yeah, and it's right. Mm -hmm. We will see new behaviors there. So they're two-sided sword. But I don't think that we should see regulation necessarily as a conservative. Uh, Gesture. I remember in a conversation with one of your colleagues in BCT, Uriol Jorba, um, he told me something very interesting. He told, hey, I mean, he's, he, he said to me, every technology we know has limits. Uh, he, he was telling me, think of the car. I mean, it would be crazy to think that whatever, I mean, any sort of car that the company can build, I can buy it and drive it in the street. I mean, if you think of the regulations, what is allowed as a car that you can buy, that you can use it on the street? And he said there is a huge limitation of the car technology. And then he was thinking, uh, I don't know, think of the atomic. Uh, so, and so he was uh, saying to me, that's a normal thing to do. All powerful technology, after the... Uh, confusion in the beginning, after the craziness of, oh, wow, what, what, a lot of things can be done, comes to a moment where we need just to agree in how we use it. I mean, uh, perhaps it's only that. It's not that we have to be very conservative and against technology. It's just that we need, we need just to decide collectively how this thing will go on. 
Yeah, but then like a, a car, nobody kind of <clears throat> tells you where you are allowed to drive. It, it's just more about safety regulations. But yeah, uh, and and creativity yeah. is more like that. What I said before, it's more like a journey. And and sometimes you might have to go through forbidden territory in order to come out at the other side where where there's something new to be found. But uh, if you already kind of try to regulate the things that go in, then uh, I don't know. We yeah, we no, tend to produce from. Uh, I, so I think you have to have everything in there in order to get something out. If you just limit it to the whatever consented mm -hmm. stuff, then well, you will also just get a limited possible output. So yep. I think I would rather put the filter on the out on the outcome. So and uh, say well. Just because the AI produced it, it doesn't make mean it's yours. So you still have to see if whatever you just created is like a very is like almost like a total derivative of some some artist or. And that's also of course about the maybe your intention. So yes, if I deliberately steal your voice, then. Uh, that's definitely not okay, but if I maybe you start with your voice, but then turn it into something else, and uh, yes, I used your data without your consent, but in the end, it might even be totally indistinguishable from you. You would you still like to control that, or that would be like in the regulation, you know? Yeah, uh, but then how can you regulate for all the possibilities that will come? So that I I just don't know how you practically can actually regulate this. Like because the regulation means bureaucracy, and bureaucracy is kind of the exact opposite of creativity. And uh, so, how can you kind of write a form about some way creative project? Or so I don't know. I yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would hope that uh, we find a different way, but I, I enjoy it while it lasts so far, and uh, hope that <laughs> we don't get to the point Be because then probably I will just go somewhere else because that's not how I see creativity. I think there should be enough freedom. It's, but not the freedom, of course. I mean, to explore things, you still are not uh, free from from responsibility. What you put out in the world and claim it's yours. So that's definitely there are the two things. That's very interesting. Would you allow me to open the mic to the audience? Because otherwise, oh. I mean, oh, we already we have there. a lot. <laughs> we have ten minutes, so it would be the appropriate. Otherwise, as you can see, we can continue <laughs> for some time. Uh, but it would be nice to have. Uh, the chance for comments or questions, your experience with AI. So yesterday when I was uh, on Twitter uh, for the conference, I, I saw that Prado Misiu was working with uh, a Barcelona Supercomputing Center uh, to use yeah. artificial intelligence for a project. So I would like to know more details from Fernando directly. Uh, I, I don't know about that project very much. So <laughs> I, don't, I cannot give you more details than what is public. So is someone in your team working in this in these things? What? Uh, not directly? No, not in my group, but uh, we can get you in, in contact with somebody. Okay. Okay. In fact, I, I do know something about this project because that's a project by Kim and uh, and uh, ah. Maria Cristina. So the scientists working with Maria are involved in that project. And uh, so what I can tell you is that they have the problem that that's a fascinating problem that the internet it's very strictly contemporary and if you read in the in the description they have like a classical painting of some kind of uh, lady like this and the uh, AI I mean it's a project about uh, descriptions of pictures that that's very important for a museum for the archive and so on and they have a, a classical painting of a lady like this and the AI says that he's talking on the phone ah. so <laughs> or yeah, so the problem they have <laughs> is that when, when we use ChatGPT, we think that the the machine is very powerful, but it is strictly contemporary, and so for the machine, it's very difficult to think that that thing it's not talking on the phone. So they have the problem of addressing the proper data set. That's Technically the speaking, is. it's not that yeah. it's contemporary. It's just there is more data yeah. on contemporary yeah. descriptions of pictures than classical descriptions of pictures. So you have to uh, fine tune these models. Uh, we, if you know that this is a painting from the 1600s, then you cannot use it uh, raw. You have to fine tune it in order to be able to extract the correct context and, and details uh, from the image. So there is not enough data to, so that the image, the, the models can recognize exactly what's going on. They are just applying what's the most likely description, and this is what uh, it, it looks like contemporary. But it's just that there's more data on, on that. 
funnily enough, like a five-year-old now would probably see exactly the same thing. So, <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, like if they look at that painting. <laughs> I have another question, I think. Yeah, uh, well, absolutely fascinating conversation um, between like artists and the scientists. I, I was just uh, just a little bit fun question, uh, especially for Mario. Um, what when do you think we're going to see the first singer or artist that uh, is completely AI based? With uh, what's your best bet? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm conflicted here because, of course, I say we already have that, yeah. like on the visual <laughs> thing. So to plug my own project, Botto, which is kind of, uh, well, ideally the world's, world first autonomous artificial artist. So and it's a project in order to find out if it's possible to create an AI, which is seen as perceived as an artist. So and yeah, Botto has been around for two years now. It's very successfully selling uh, art on the blockchain, but uh, in a way it's kind of the inverse of a cyborg because I realized that at the moment AI is not at the point yet where you can be fully autonomous. So it's kind of this human community AI hybrid where the AI is doing the creation part, but the, the community steers its taste, so it, it votes and the machine learns. But yeah, so I believe Botto is on the on the good path. It's uh, been exhibited uh, in, in various shows. Uh, actually, uh, just, just to plug it, I think uh, in a month there will be it will one of its pieces will be auctioned as Christie's. So in a way, if you have a bucket list of what makes an artist, uh, Botto has pretty much uh, kind of done a lot of things that uh, like. I had a lot, it took me a long time to, to check all these boxes. So, but yeah, there's always the typical thing about like, when do we actually say, yeah, but it's actually the machine doing it. It's not kind of, well, some humans. To, so there, there will always this skepticism. But I think also music singing wise, there, there are like projects out there. But yeah, it's always hard to kind of draw the line. When is it? kind of nice, cleverly puppeteered, or is actually autonomous. And I think actual autonomy is to, at the moment, not not possible yet. It's, I mean, if anybody claims that, then it's kind of... Uh, hey. It's yeah, it's bullshit. Yes, <laughs> there's no agency, right? No, exactly. So, and I mean, in a way, a machine at the moment never has its own motivations to do these things. So, it's just to say it again. So, in case of Botto. Botto's motivation is to please, which is kind of not what typical artists do, but in its way to survive and, and maintain its uh, long-term life, it tries to please its community and, of course, its collectors by making art that sells. And that works. <laughs> so, yeah, Botto has made more money than I have. Money. Unfortunately, I don't get any of that. So that's the <laughs> tricky part. But, yeah. I'm so sorry, but I found so boring talking about regulation in a talk about new creativity paradigm. It's my opinion. It's a loss of time that like having this artist here to, to talk about this. But I propose, uh, because I know like Mario have been pioneer uh, using in a new uh, roles of creativity, and also maybe you can, the rest of the panel can talk about, if can open the mind to people like what kind of use in art um, are you using? Because I know, like Mario just say now, uh, he did like uh, autonomous artists, but I know you are working with uh, IE as a muse, IE as a critic. Uh, is, uh, there is many roles, and I would like to, if you can talk a little bit about this. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so in a way, the way I create is like, so I find the traditional artist model that say you first work until you find your signature style and become recognized for that and then keep repeating that until the end of your life. So I don't know, that seems like that's <laughs> a very small nutshell in times of AI kind of limited because yes, we can theoretically have AIs finding kind of a visual style or a musical style and then keep doing that. So for my approach is kind of, I try to yeah see how can I use AI and then identify certain things where I feel I can contribute something. So yeah, so I 
of course, initially did the whole visual explorations and working with uh, closed systems that try to stay interesting. That's one of those things where you, in a way, like once you devise kind of a, a system, a, co a computational system, it kind of does not evolve anymore, right? Because like a human, because it doesn't get any input. So that's one of those that was memories of passes by then. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't want to kind of like do the portfolio thing. <laughs> so, but yeah, I try always to identify certain aspects of AI that that I found interesting. So there was, of course, also the whole area of meaning, like uh, which was I you made uh, in, when I used a, well, created appropriate response. It was that idea like how much meaning can humans put into a single sentence? And so, of course, epigrams, uh, famous quotes, are kind of one of our ways to explain life in extremely compressed form. And then if you look at it from a computational view, it's just, I don't know, a hundred letters. And if you get the combination right, it suddenly means something to people. So, and of course, using AI, I can go, I can filter out all the randomness and just try to condense it down to, potential sentences that mean something to a human, not to the machine. And so appropriate response tried to close that loop between having the machine present you with something potentially meaningful, but you have to actually close the loop and, and make it meaningful. So I don't know. So, and yeah, and, and my latest just to plug it is kind of Ica, which is actually a robotic dog, which is an art critique. So kind of like I'm changing the roles there. <laughs> so yeah, so it's, <laughs> and, and the, the twist is that it, so yeah, it, it autonomously goes through art spaces, galleries, museums, decides which art to critique. And then of course it is using the latest kind of GPT-3, 4 to produce a critique out of its butt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hope that's enough. Actually, I think that it's very important to talk about regulations. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I think about that, animated. not about, we, we don't have to decide now, like, this kind of policies. But I think that uh, relating to what is creativity, AI, like, opens this, this new world about thinking about maybe, like, collective creation and how all these myths in the art world maybe are uh, colliding, you know, like this idea of the genius or the artist that is like enclosed. So maybe like mm, we should think about this kind of thing, our regulations, uh, to think on a more uh, maybe philosophical level about how uh, creation works and how has been working for many years uh, on our culture. Because maybe like, this AI thing is like replicating how we work, like how you said, like this culture of sampling and yeah, maybe it's a, a problem for uh, the market. Actually, I think like the, the main problem is the market and how to protect artists because they have to live out, out of that. But uh, actually, like when you talk about creativity, I think there are big questions about this, these things. So I would like to ask how uh, working with AI uh, has changed how you feel about what being an artist itself uh, is. That's a very good question. I, <laughs> and that's a lot of people um, claiming that what we thought was uh, our own uniqueness in, in the creative, creative, creative process uh, can actually be reproduced by an, a statistical algorithm very realistically. And maybe we, we still have an edge or we can still put something on top of that, but it looks like the basic process is, uh, uh, can be reproduced mathematically. So that makes us question a, a lot of things. Uh, and and I, I don't have the answer, but it's certainly something that we can think about and whether what we can put on, what we can put on top of that uh, output, if, if we have the basics solved, uh, we, like communication, visual, uh, and, and sonoric communication, okay, what do we do on top of that? That's uh, for me the question, because we still uh, think we are unique, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, for example, in this, uh, I think it's a very good question also, and what, uh, so the, 
the idea of creating a voice out of how much how many visitors are going to sing you know this is putting exactly like your ideas somehow in a, in practice you know because it's a voice that is going to be one out of thousands and of course um they are going to be like we want to tell them that they are going to be out of our data. <laughs> but it could also be, like, we could also do a training on not saying that, you know? Like, it could be part of the uh, conceptual approach of the installation. And But, uh, like, I, I decided that, that we will invite people to do it. And with that, we are thinking how, in the use of this uh, choral voice, you know, um, and people will have like power on deciding how to use it or not, you know. So it's really a, like um, everything that you said. It's in 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 this, you know. And and what it, what it has to do with artists, you know, for me, what it's interesting is the idea of creating a voice, which is how like as a singer you create your own also. But of course, it has to do philosophically. It's really blow minding because it's your craft and then you have to like you are building it out of it 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 automatically makes it possible for other people to think through your to sing through your voice which changes totally the the landscape it's still your artwork right you would say know. that's a bit interesting <laughs> so <laughs> it's your name on it not the thousands of people you use as data source. No, I'm just like in a way I'm no, no, doing no, so. It's not. So everyone who is involved gets their credit and uh, eventually royalties, oh. or mm, there won't be royalties, but we are thinking <laughs> of that, of course. Yeah. And this is how, and 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 these are the challenges. Yes. It, but yeah, and you already see how it's kind of difficult to, yeah, sort this, right? Yeah, so but this doesn't make me not no, no, no. to acknowledge it, you know, no, and I, to like. Like no, I, I was just kind this, of uh, poking there that like the moment you start getting creative and, and see, oh, yes, now we can build this. Once you start trying to actually boil it down to, OK, how do we you? Yeah, you yeah, <laughs> I, I kind of limited in your freedom to, to take it. Uh, I understand your yeah. point, but I think it's reasonable to have others, you know, yeah, because absolutely. it's actually like this moment. It's about that, you know, mm -hmm. about having so much different ideas. Some of them can be like not compatible, some others just can fit and some others can push us to find new ways to, to think and use Absolutely. these tools. I think we have just one last question. Well, um, probably another question, just some random thoughts. And actually the debate right here was very interesting because it shows how all the, the uh, debate about AI is, should not go in the stupid direction of finding the autonomous artist. That's just bullshit. The interesting thing is that here we have examples like Maria's and Mario's work of like synthetic uh, forms of, of creation, of cognition, which is kind of, at the moment it's, uh, it's really uneven, uh, it's strange, it can be controversial, but that's, that's the interesting thing. And it's not new, actually, because our cognition, our intelligence, our smartness, our sensitivity even always was built through tools through technologies of any kind. We always thought together stuff and together with other people, of course. And that's precisely the case. It's nothing really new. The scale is different. The acceleration is different. So going back to regulation, oh, regulation will probably come. It's probably boring. Artists do not deal very well with regulations in general. But in this case, let's skip regulation at all. Let's go against regulation. Uh, but then at one condition, let's break the monopoly then of big AI systems, AI, AI models, which is probably not very easy because uh, the models that we are dealing with now uh, need to be huge. But maybe we could start like break the monopoly and figure something out out of that. That would be an interesting regulation rather than censoring some words or using some models or some data sets instead of others. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I fun. actually I totally agree. I think uh, well, there should be a rule where every major closed model has to be kind of open sourced after a certain time, because yeah, so very short time ideally. I mean, there. I mean, problem is if you did this way, nobody would invest in it anymore. So you have it's just like patents. So you have to give them some time to make money. But then yes, that knowledge has to be shared. And I totally agree with you with the problem that the control that big companies now have about creative output and deciding what's proper art and what's forbidden. So I 
that's why I try to use open source models as much as possible because this is really going into a weird direction now. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank welcome. you very much, Mario, Maria, Fernando. That was really great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.